Welcome family. So we are now entering part two with Dr. Claude Anderson as he speaks to Black America. And he is bringing out some points that we need to know about history from the beginning to the end. Oh my God, please leave a comment at the end of this video. It's the encourager. We'll see you right here on the next video. Instead of going down and say, why don't, why can't blacks come in from the islands and from Haiti? They do the same thing because they're seeing things upside down and backwards. They do the same thing the whites do. Say, well, what we need to do is, is invade that country and make them stay there. Let's improve the conditions there. And so that way they have nice places there. Rather than say, no, no, you didn't improve all the conditions in Mexico and El Salvador and Nicaragua and Hungary. And all these other countries, when the people came in, you didn't improve all the conditions in Vietnam to bring in the people. Why do you keep asking these special things black? No leadership will raise the questions. Because you see, no black leadership in America wants to raise the real issues about why we cannot raise our population and others can. In a social democracy where the majority will win and the minority will lose, we are the only, we are the only plan systematically, permanently, classified minority which means that we are the only people who will always lose based on immigration laws and the quotas coming into this country unless we start to develop some very specific ways of dealing with it that's what power nomics is about i start telling you you got to start changing the rules turn things back upside down you got to always practice how do you get to be the majority never do anything where you're going to be a minority do it where you're going to become the majority don't move to be a minority move to be a majority and we're going to talk about that a little later on, on how you play these games and learn how to win in Pionomics. But you see, as I said, by, the civil, by, by 1790, the law had locked us out as the only permanent loser. And they said that anybody losing the society from now on, it would be black people. They're the only people that cannot increase their population significantly to be a threat to this country. By, 17, by the late part of the 1790s, they said, we need to, they said, what other kind of external controls can we put on black folk? Because now some of them want to learn, some of them want to, want to try to join uh, the religious movement in this country. And, 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 and in religion, we say that everybody's a brother. And, uh, and we baptize them and make them a Christian. How do, how, how do we deal with that fact? So they passed the law, saying that Christianity did not relieve your heathenism for a black person. And... Uh, they did not want, and after that time, that few blacks had been going to church, but they were sitting on sitting in white churches, and they had to be monitored and watched, as I told you, because of the Diversity Act. So when the evangelical movement started moving through this country in the turn of the first of the eight, in the 1800s, early 1800s, they said, we'll let blacks have their churches, but we can always also, but we, but we must pick, the, money, pick the, uh, the ministers, and we must license the ministers. We must pick ministers that we can control. No black preacher can come into America unless he is controlled by the white establishment unless he represents our interests and our values, unless he teaches our form of Christianity. Now, this is very important. Why? Because, you see, before, religion was always used to help a population group. When it comes to blacks, we cannot let religion be used to help them. You see, the Catholics, church took after care of all those groups who call themselves Catholics. Jews, priests, took care of the Jews. And even today, you go, into, you go into the conflicts in England or Ireland, where you see the Protestants and the Catholics fighting. I guarantee you that the Protestant members, members will be representing their people and protecting them. I guarantee you that the Catholic priests will be representing the Catholics and protecting them. If I take you into the Middle East with the Arabs, I guarantee you Khomeini would be taking care of Arabs. Only in America can I find black ministers who can be bought and sold to be against their own people. <laughs> Nobody else will let you do that. No, no population will tolerate that except our people. And that's what I call inappropriate behavior. Inappropriate behavior pattern, when you let your own minister sell you out. It's not in your best interest. What I mean by sell you out is because by the early 1800s, the whites said, well, we're going to have black ministers. We've got to have to christen them to make sure they do what we want to have done. They must teach Christianity the way we want it taught, to where it is an external control device on black folk. 
They said, what are the rules? One, that every minister we license must teach black folk. And we talk about the slave and the master in the Bible, that you're talking about the white man and the black man on earth. Two, you must teach black, the minister must teach black folk that they're to be loyal, faithful, obedient, respectful, and all those other good things and honest so that white people have to worry about them stealing as a slave. Because you know, black slaves had a nasty habit of going around stealing scraps of food because they were starving to death. And they would tell my, they must be industrious. But you see, white folks want you to work a little harder. So they use the term, he's a lazy slave. Now, anybody in his right mind got more than a third grade education would say, why would a slave want to be industrial? <laughs> why would you want to work hard as a slave? What's in it for you? Are you going to get released or are you going to get a pension? <laughs> Social security or retirement? But they always got this thing about, why, he's a lazy slave. I even got a black writer that writes about that day. But part of the problem is the blacks were lazy slaves. He should have been lazy. <laughs> the third thing they put on you is that, well, the black ministers must also teach them to get pie in the sky after death. Gonna turn their world upside down. So while everybody else is competing to get resources, to get wealth, to get power, black folk are saying, I'm waiting for mine in the sky. <laughs> they said, well, the role model would be Jesus Christ. Said, yeah, uh, Jesus Christ and all the Jews were very powerful people, had money. Solomon was the richest man on earth. You go look at Matthew, I think Matthew 23, when they start talking about the talent. But the different slaves had talents. And two of them went out and developed their talents and multiplied and made something. And one buried and hid his. Because they knew that would be that black one to be that last one to go out and hide it. <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm talking about? Now, but during that period of time, though, in the 1800s, when all this, they started putting all the religion on them, they started controlling them. A few blacks said, well, wait a minute now, because something just happened down in Haiti. Now, I know that I, I can guess in the future y'all are going to let the Haitians into this country, but in the 1800s, what happened was Toussaint Overture. Toussaint Overture took his little band of rabble-rousing blacks in Haiti and beat the devil out of all the French troops. Beat, ran them raggedy. Beat the devil out of them. Now, that was important because, for two reasons. First of all, that is the only time in Western history where the white society blinked and black folk took advantage of them and beat them. Y'all remember that. Only time in history that, that blacks ever broke free of that conditioning system I told you in 1710, the same way they used again in, uh, World War, in the Korean War. And again, the reason I want to point out that system to you, that, that brainwashing system, why is it so important? You all remember this and why it's so important. And that's why I must give the dominant white society praise for this. I mean, they're some very smart people. Very smart. Why did I say that? They're very, because, you see, the people that put that system on black folk in 1710, they had the equivalent of a third or fourth grade education. And here we are today, 250 years later, or 200 some years later, almost 300, and black folk with doctor's degrees and master's degrees can't figure it out. <laughs> now, but the little Tucson Overture down in Haiti, he won his battle, beat him good. Now, that meant when he beat him, though, they finally tricked him and said, well, now that, we are, that you've beaten us, wouldn't you like to come together and integrate? He went to discuss it with them at a meeting. They captured him, put him on a boat, and shipped him to uh, someplace in, in Europe, uh, some country where in, the, in the Iceland, when it was, I think, Finland or someplace, and they froze him to death up there in the prison. Because he went, and went to co op. And I told you in Korea, in the career and the brainwashing techniques, there's another principle that says that anytime you want to control anybody, I can control anybody who's willing to talk and compromise and discuss with me. I can get him to compromise. 
And see what we said, what trying to teach our soldier was a call, call, call a code of conduct in Korea, which says never, never talk to your enemy unless it's on your turf and your terms. And see, right now, with, our, with I'm a system, system police commission, I'm working as a therapist for, for prisoners. Anytime I get somebody to communicate and talk with me, I got him. If he'll speak to me and answer my questions, I got him. Sooner or later, he's going to break down and tell me what I want him to what I know. The way you resist is you don't communicate. You don't compromise your principles. They can never beat you then. And see, and that's how they got overture. They asked him, don't you want some integration? So like I told our leaders, the same thing. Now, there were some other blacks who jumped up and said, I'm not going to go for that okie doke. And one of the first ones in 1800 was, uh, was Gabriel Prosser. Gabriel was an extremely smart black guy. He says, I just heard about what Toussaint Overture did down in the islands. And said, if Tucson can do it, I'm going to do it here. He said, I'm going to do the same thing. And he did some planning and you couldn't believe he worked, he planned, he schemed. Tucson, well, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, Prosser really worked on his thing. And he planned one of the most devastatingly, strategically well-planned insurrections on earth. Now, before I tell you what he did, let me go ahead and make this point. I tracked between 1710 and 1860, and we had a possible 150 to 200 possible slave revolts. And in all 150, 200 of them, a black person squealed in every one of them and got his meritorious manumission and his Willie Lynch badge card. <laughs> and so when Prosser was trying to pull his together, he planned his scheme. And when the day he was supposed to have his big revolt, would you believe one of the most severe storms that ever hit Virginia came in and washed out most of the land and roads and bridges and process group couldn't get together their gathering point because they were planning on hitting three things. They were planning on taking over the penitentiary in Richmond. They were planning on taking over the armory and they were planning on attacking the town and annihilating the town. Everybody except the Methodists and the Quakers who had befriended them. And the storm struck just as they're going to assemble. And only 300 showed up and Prosser said, well, since only 300 of us here, let's put it off until next week when the land is dry and clear. And within three days, a black person squealed. Prosser was arrested along with 35 of his supporters. They were executed, hanging, heads chopped off, put on poles. But the two blacks that did the squealing one was called Tom, the other was called Pharaoh. And I don't know, God knows it because I don't know. Why is the name of a black person Tom? You almost guess he's going to do something. <laughs> now, I don't know, and I don't mean to put down anybody in your name Tom, but I'll let something about that name. <laughs> and Pharaoh itself is not too much of an exciting name. I wouldn't trust that name either. If somebody my mother named me Pharaoh, I'd know I'm in a world of trouble too. But anyway, Tom and Pharaoh turned in Prosser. They, they executed Prosser, chopped his head off, along with some other, and hung him up on, on poles. But the thing that, that, that became very important in that case, though, was that the town was really fearful because they found out from rumors that Prosser had lined up somewhere between five and 50,000 slaves. The whites all through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, was paralyzed. Their mouths fell open, their eyes they popped, they said, whoa, 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 something is wrong. You mean tell me we put a conditioning system on black folk where we turn everything upside down? And this black, this black guy was able to do the impossible without an education? Something is wrong with our system. What's wrong? And I'm serious. This was a big issue. They had to find out how this one black guy get together as a slave and have something between five and 50,000 blacks ready to fight and had not been for a storm, they'd have taken over the country. And finally came out to another rumor, speculations, that what it was, was that he had beat the symbolism. To show you how important symbols are, that's why I keep telling about powernomics. To get out of your system, sometimes you're lost, you look up at a mountain, you look up at a peak, you look for the Penobscot building or the Empire State Building, you find your symbol, you can find your direction. 
and what that black Don Foss had done, he looked at the state seal. The state of Virginia had a seal where it had a white man lying prostrate and a black man's foot on his chest. The white and the black guy was called, Ver and in, in the seal it said, Verticus overcomes Tyrannus. And that black man had used that seal as his motivating force, his guiding light for his people. And when the whites found that out, immediately they changed the Virginia seal and said, get rid of that seal fast. <laughs> and put up guards around the capital to make sure it didn't happen again. And that was in, that was in 1800. By 1821, another black named V.C. got equally as concerned. He had heard about it. He said, he's going to try it in South Carolina. And try another revolt. But V.C. says up front, V.C. organized his group. He walked around. He was a free black. He got free because he bought his own, paid, his, paid $600 and freed himself. He won money in a lottery. But he was very upset because he couldn't buy his children out of slavery. So V.C. would walk through the town in, in, in Charleston, South Carolina, telling black folk, get that hump out of your back. Straighten up. Be respectful. Take care of your own people. Look out for your own people. Quit trying to worry about everybody and look out for yourselves. And V.C. was very, he was a big man too, a big broad man. He said, I'll break your back if I catch you bending over. And he planned an insurrection. And he called something like about three to 500 together to take over Charleston, South Carolina. But he told them up front, he said, let me tell you all something. He says, I catch one black in this group trying to get meritorious manumission. He said, I'm going to snap your neck like a twig. <laughs> and he planned a revolt. And unfortunately, again, two days before his revolt was supposed to occur, not only was he squealed on once, he was squealed on twice. And so V.C. was picked up along with about 37 of his people and hung. Because again, they sold him out. Then by 1831, Nat Turner, you already know about, tried the same thing a few years later in 31. Nat Turner said that I'm not even going to go through those changes. I'm not going to do what V.C. did. I'm not going to do what Prosser did. I'm not even going to play that silly game. He said, what am I going to do? He said, I'm going to break out of here. I'm getting me a knife, gun, sword, stick, tools, bricks, anything I can get. I'm killing anything I see that moves, crawls, jumps, walks, or talks. That's exactly what I'm, I'm quoting him. He says, I'm, he's, I'm the rod and staff of God. I'm not playing these silly games. I'm tired. And so, so Turner started walking, saying he was a sword and the voice of God. He said, I'm going to kill anything I see moving. He killed 55 people, including his own master. And then the country got petrified again and sent the, sent the army in looking for him. They searched for, they searched for that Turner for two months and couldn't find him. He hid out because he killed so many people. Until one day he needed food and went down to get some, some, some blacks to get some food. And guess what happened? Turned him in. And so that took care of Nat Turner. Same time as one other black, though, which is my hero. I don't know how much time I got. How much time? As long as I want. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. You see, you all are so nice. That's why I love coming to this city. Boy, I swear. I love you. I, I, I'm going to move out here pretty soon. Um, but, but my hero is John Horse. We start talking about in, inappropriate behavior versus appropriate behavior. Now, here's a black man at the same time period displayed what I call appropriate behavior. No Rodney King stuff, you see? John Horse was a runaway slave who had also run off to, south, south, uh, to Florida in the early 1800s in the same period when V.C. And, and Turner and the rest of them were trying to revolt. John Horse was a big, burly, strong black man. He ran off to Florida. Contrary to what you hear all the time in, in, you know, in the media about the Underground Railroad, all blacks trying to get north, get to, the, get to the promised land. That's part of that myth. Most blacks weren't that dumb. Why would they want to go all the way across the north, go to the north, a thousand miles to a hostile white country, when they could run off to Florida, which is Spanish territory, 20 miles away or two feet away? 
So some of the smarter black of our relatives ran off to Florida because that was Spanish territory. And they got down in there interbred and intermixed with the Seminoles. Now, you all might ask me why about Seminoles. Now, Seminoles were also against blacks, a lot of them, but a lot of them were not. Seminoles were the most receptive blacks, receptive Indians to do anything with blacks in the country. Why? Because you see, the word Seminole means runaway slave. Okay? And they were also runaways. They interbred with blacks. They were a mixture of blacks. So they were very receptive to black folk. And so they started fighting in that area to fight the United States because the United States didn't want to go down there and try to get the slaves black back. And they sent, that's what they were sending General Andrew Jackson to Florida for, to get the slaves. Because, you see, blacks down there were coming across the border periodically with the Indians raiding and killing whites and getting their people free. Now, why is that important? Because, you see, when I talked about early inappropriate behavior in Africa, the reason they enslaved black folk originally was because our leaders in Africa had given the impression that I don't care about other black folk. And they hauled all those blacks around the world because they knew in their hearts they would never see a shipload of Africans coming to get them back. They never suspected that Africans would come to save Africans. But that's why they didn't try to enslave Indians, because they knew if they enslaved Indians, Indians would come get their people. But they knew that black leadership in Africa had already said, you can have them, I don't want them, I won't come to get them. And so when the blacks went off into, in the, in the south, in the, in, the, in the Florida, they were coming across the border, raiding those, those, those plantations along Alabama and the Georgia border there, South Carolina border, taking their people, sending it, taking them back to South, I mean, down to Florida, getting them free. Uh, but John Horse was a leading hero to me. Now, this black hooked up, he became sort of like the, uh, the second in charge in Africa, I mean, in, uh, in uh, Florida. The chief at that time, in, in, during the 1820s, 1830s, was uh, a chief named Osceola. Osceola had about three sons that were very active also, fighting uh, white intrusion into 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 Florida to get the slaves back. His number one son was, uh, uh, was a white, uh, I mean, a mixture of black and white. His name was a uh, wildcat. And Osceola himself, if you all don't know it, Osceola was married to a black woman. You might see Osceola's pictures in all the museums as an Indian. They don't ever tell you that he was married to a black woman and had a mixed group. And he married to a, a black woman. Married, his black woman's name was Morning Dew, if you're interested in knowing it. Morning Dew was the one, and that's what triggered Seminole Wars. They don't tell you that in the history books either. So going back and forth down there, they were trying to uh, trying to get the Indians back. I mean, trying to get the slaves back from the Indians. And uh, and they kept sending the, the federal troops in there. And Andrew Jackson was one of the, one of the primary generals that always wanted to go out there and fight Indians. He loved to fight Indians. He's known as the Indian fighter. And that's why you have Jacksonville, Florida, because he was going in there again fighting Indians and try, trying to get blacks back. And, and on the Chattahoochee River, right outside Tallahassee, they had a fort there called Fort Negro, where most of the blacks were living, staying there. And they sent the federal troops down there to, to, to get the, the slaves back. Then the, uh, the federal boat came up the Chattahoochee River to Fort Negro, and most of the blacks were out with the Indians raiding, fighting, and uh, left the women and kids there. And so the troops, uh, the federal troops fired on Fort Negro, one shot, and a shot rolled into the, uh, into the armory and set off the explosion and blew up the entire fort. And there was nothing in there but black women and children. And that, and that really made them hostile. The blacks were hostile this time. So now, they, so, so then they, that, that triggered the second Seminole War. After that, uh, they decided to have a truce. They said, we have a truce. If we can, we sit down with, with, with Osceola and his, soul, and his warriors, John Horse and the rest of them. And at that point in time, they met. Uh, before they met, they went and kidnapped Morning Dew and told uh, Osceola that if you want your wife back, you better turn some of those black slaves loose and meet with us. And when Osceola went to the meeting to, uh, to discuss getting his wife back, they kidnapped him and put him in prison. I think up in Fort Sumter, South Carolina, he died of consumption and exposure. And uh, so at that point in time, John Horse and, and Wildcat went berserk. Then they started fighting. They fought all the way throughout Florida and finally ran them out of Florida. They went out west and led some of, the, some of the, that whole movement called the Trail of Tears all the way out to Oklahoma Territory. 
And uh, but the only people who were fighting in this country against the United States at that time was was John Horse and Wildcat and his band of blacks. They had carried their own women and kids with them. That is the only black man in the history of this nation, and I'm sorry to say there's no school teachers that that's the only black man in America that's ever stood up to America and fought it fought him, and not as a slave, but as a man. Nobody else has ever done it. <laughs> John Horace fought the United fought the United States for 50 years. They fought him all out west. They chased him all down through the west, through Oklahoma, through Texas and finally chased him into Mexico. He went into Mexico and stayed there for, not, for about five or six years and came back again, he, he and Wildcat. They tried to set up their little village again, but the whites out there, the racists kept, kept raiding, their, raiding their camps, shooting them and killing them. He kept fighting and they finally killed Wildcat, shot him in the back with a shotgun and killed him. And then the John Horse finally just gave up and got on his horse, allegedly and just rolled off back into Mexico. You never heard from him again. But he fought for 50 years. The only black man. You can talk about any civil rights leader you want to. If you had a hero, that's the only hero we ever had that fought and says, I'm not a slave and I won't take it. I'm not Rodney King, anybody else. And so, but it, and they found, nobody ever knew what, knew what happened to him, but he rolled off. That was John Horse. Now, the, uh, now this whole meritorious manumission policy is in effect, moving along at the same time, this control system. About 1852, a lady named Harriet Beach Stover began wanting to write about it. So she then wrote about the whole thing. She interviewed a guy whose name uh, was Henson, which you all would know as Uncle Tom. He then told about the story. She wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. But in that book, contrary to what most people think, Uncle Tom was not the bad guy. The bad guy was Sambo. And so I'm asking you all as my brothers and sisters, please in the future don't call a black guy who you know is worthless and trifling, don't call him an Uncle Tom, that's complimenting him. Call him his real name, what he's entitled to, and that's a Sambo. Any black person, <laughs> any black person sells his own people out and, and, and will do them in, he is a Sambo. Now what is a Sambo again? Going back to Meritorious Manumission in 1710, the whole conditioning process the whole brainwashing system, the whole social engineering system says that you must teach black people to see eyes, see the world through the eyes of whites. You must see everything through their eyes. You must accept their values, their superiority, whatever they think and feel, and that way you are, we got you contained. And that's why when you see somebody like Colin Powell come out running for office, they say, well, you can run for office if you see the things the way we want to see them. If you want to be conservative, you can run for office. If you want to place a lot of importance on abortion, you can run for office. If you want to talk about being anti-taxing, you can run for office, which means that if you see things the way we see them as a black person, you're safe. You're acceptable. And if you don't want to do that that way, then become an athlete or an entertainer. <laughs> so therefore, you don't you identify the rest of those blacks in the country. You stay away from them. They're bad. And you start going on, you try to go get a, try to go get a penny out of an athlete and entertain and do something for the black community. They're going to do it. Their advisors won't let them do it. The agents won't do it. Their promotion people won't let them do it. They're going to identify with your community because, again, they have, they have now already died and gone to heaven. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> so, when, so when Harriet Beach Stowe put out her book, what she tried to tell black folk is that Uncle Tom was not a bad guy. See, Uncle Tom, if you read that book, and most black, 90% of black never read it. They always call another black, he's an Uncle Tom, he's an Uncle Tom. He's not an Uncle Tom. If you read the book Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom was a guy who would not beat black women. Uncle Tom, that book, was a, was a guy who would not beat other blacks to make them pick more cotton. Uncle Tom was a guy who would come in at night and take cotton out of his own bag and put it in other black folks' bags so they wouldn't get whippings at night. Uncle Tom was a guy who would not tell where black folk were hiding when they went across the river and they broke free as slaves. But, but Simon Legree, the white slave master, had a black to follow him around named... Sambo, who always says, you show me, give me the right, I'll show you how to trees the coons. I'll show you where they hides. <laughs> and see, and that's the guy. See, his role responsibility was going back to meritorious manumission. I told you about what you got to protect white folks' property, protect their wealth. He says, I will protect and find it for you. And that's why you read in those, in the, in the movies and books that came out after Uncle Tom, you always had a black guy, a black slave, running down the road saying, 
Master, master, here comes the army. Let's hide our silver and gold. <laughs> and you all say, our? <laughs> How did it get to be our? <laughs> you know, he always want to say something that doesn't even belong to him. And that showed up all through history. And today you got the same kind of personality doing.